first of all, we can talk about the market in general. Uh, we had, actually, let me see if I can show it to you. Oh, you can see trading view. Perfect. So I was going to talk about the market in general. So uh, we got our having pullback, right? So, oh, wait, hold on. Michael, if you're listening to this playback, you can start now. Because <laughs> I know he's going to have a moment where he wants to start the YouTube playback mm -hmm. and cut out all the BSing beforehand. So, Michael, if you're listening, you can start now. So, first thing I want to talk about is the macro market. So, we, um, we experienced our first major pullback uh, since we started the new strategy for the DeFi fund. And our first major pullback for the macro market in general, right at having, you know, and, and that is something that despite the ETFs basically breaking the traditions of what happens in the crypto market when it comes to all time highs, uh, this appears to be something that stayed true, which was uh, we had a having dip, whether it happened before the having or after the having sometime around the having, there's usually a dip. And so during the month of April alone, uh, Bitcoin dropped 15%, Ethereum dropped 17.5%, and then altcoins across the board, depending on which ones you were holding, on average dropped 30 to 40, some even 50%. Uh, so we definitely had a real solid flush on the market during the month of April. However, we do feel like we're getting close to what we consider local bottom. Uh, Michael and I have talked about it pretty extensively. And so I pulled up the, like, for example, the we're on the Ethereum chart, four hour chart. And what I usually look for is divergences. So like you have a little uh, bullish divergence here. I'm drawing lines on the chart. Um, so this bullish divergence, usually indicates the potential of a reversal. It's not always true. TA is subjective, but enough people do TA that it becomes mob mentality and self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you are looking at charts, you can at least have layers of confidence about what you think the market's going to do. Bullish and bearish divergences on the RSI versus the price, very common, very repeatable um, instances of a reversal. Now, it doesn't always mean that it's going to reverse long term, depending on which time frame you look at. So this is the four hour chart with this. It's not a strong bullish divergence. I would consider it a weak bullish divergence. Um, that would indicate to me that there's going to be at least a relief for the short term. Now, there is a significant. So if we open up the heat map for Bitcoin. USD. This is one of my favorite things to look at is the heat map for um, where the liquidity is. So if you go to like, say, and I can post a link for this if anybody is interested. There's different time frames that you can look at. So for us now where we're at, there is a significant amount of liquidity down in the 50 to 52 range. In fact, you can't even see it right now. Let me see if I can back out a little bit more to the three month. You can see that, perfect. So down here, there's these super thick bands of liquidity on the heat map down at the 50, 51. So generally speaking, more often than not, price likes to hunt liquidity. You can usually get a good sense of where the market wants to go, um, depending on where a lot of liquidity is sitting. Now, naturally, there's a lot of liquidity sitting up here in the 70 to 75 range. So you could have one or two scenarios play out where we continue to dip further into the low 50s. We come down here and we eat up all this liquidity. And then that's when the market on a more macro scale reverses and goes back towards a new all-time high back into the 70s and 80s. So that's something to consider from the macro standpoint. That's something that we always look at, look at when we're, we're evaluating the fund and, and kind of what assets we're playing in and 
and just our overall sentiment about um, our strategy. Well, that's something to keep in mind. Just stuff that you know we're looking at, so you can look at it too. And if you ever have any questions, uh, Michael and I are always around uh, to answer questions. But this is generally just high level macro TA, just to get a general sense of sentiment, direction, momentum, liquidity. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we look at. And Michael has different indicators from me, so that's why we work together when it comes to um, what we're doing. Going to be an interesting weekend ahead. I believe it is. Um, I think given how far we dropped in April, um, you generally will see a relief rally, even if it's not sustained. But it is May, right? So if anybody's been in crypto for a while or just in trading in general, very common saying is uh, sell in May and go away. You know, May is generally a non-eventful usually a red month uh for trading and for assets in general uh so we'll see if this may beats that stereotype and then uh, and then goes from there so that's just kind of general like sense of the macro market kind of how we feel about it and i do th i do think we're in a position where we could see a nice relief rally into the first half of this month see some nice gains back on altcoins and, and uh, on Bitcoin and ETH. And, um, and then kind of go from there. I still think I wouldn't get too optimistic. I still think you could see that 50 to 52 range uh, become a possibility simply because um, there is so much liquidity sitting there and uh, you know the market does have an opportunity to go down there and sweep that. And because we dropped to say 57, um, it's not a huge reach to go from 57 to 50. You know, that's about a 13% drop, 11%, 13. I don't remember now. I can't do the math in my head. It's not a big drop to go from 57 to 50. Uh, so that liquidity is ripe for the taking. So we'll just see what the market chooses to do over the next few weeks. But that's general sense in May. Uh, when it comes to the protocol itself, uh, everything is running smoothly. Any issues we had with uh, pending rewards for the farm for individuals has been fixed. Um, you'd be amazed that at the end of the day, half of your problems are usually human error. That's just the nature of technology, right? Like the easiest way to hack somebody is social engineering. And... Uh, the easiest way to fix a problem is to go back and look at the fundamentals, look at the settings, look at like the basics of what's going on. And, and so for that specific issue, uh, we have different thresholds for rewards, right? So generally, it's about 150 tokens will trigger anybody's individual rewards, um, whether it's you know 150 tokens on the farm or 150 tokens pending rewards on staking. Well... Inside of that, there is a minimum balance to trigger rewards as well. And so generally, we try to keep that above like $10. And here's the reason why. The way our dynamic strategies works and the way the gas that is expended when we process dynamic strategies works, that, that gas grows linearly. So every new wallet that has dynamic strategies, it adds one more piece of transaction costs and so what we didn't want to do is have somebody there's always somebody in crypto it's not it's not wrong to be overly paranoid there's always somebody in crypto who likes to just break things to break things so one of the risks was is that somebody sets up like a hundred wallets or a thousand wallets with like a dollar in it and it just triggers like this constant um, like high revving, overly expensive gas fees for the protocol. And they can just kind of spam the contracts to the point where they might break. And so in order to stop that from happening, we instituted a minimum holding to trigger rewards. Again, I think it's, I think it's either $10 or $50. It's a small number relative to portfolios. Anyways, the setting for the farms was set at 150 tokens, but those tokens were LP tokens, which meant that the farm's minimum 
balance to trigger was like seventeen hundred dollars. So a bunch of people inadvertently got left out of their rewards triggering. Fix that, and everything's going back to normal. So, um, so that's just a funny little thing that happened. Uh, anyway, I guess we can get into the report now. There's no new updates on the NFTs. Uh, rewards are flowing as anticipated. Got NFTs. Got their monthly payout at the beginning of the month, and. Uh, that's about it. So we can get into the monthly report uh, for the month of April. This was our first month of real st- stress testing of the um, strategy, of the protocol, of what we're trying to accomplish. And I think we did a really good job given the circumstances. And we'll go over that in detail. And so April end of the month report, contents, we go over that every time. So circulating market cap, 637 at the end of the month, 1.8 million tokens burned, price of about 1.07 cents. Uh, I can zoom in on this. So April was the first major retracement experience for the DeFi fund since the new tra- strategy was implemented. Um, the portfolio performed really well. We had 8.16% uh, yield on the DeFi fund uh, for the month of April. Um, but at the same time, assets did contract in value, and we'll go over that over the, on the next slides. Um, lifetime yield generated for the fund is almost 300,000, almost. Um, and that is over the last uh, nine months. And the first two months were pretty low. So a vast majority of that was in the last seven months. Again, once as we continue to grow and fine tune and refine the strategy, that number and that efficiency will continue to increase. April yield generated for the month was uh, $40,798, 8.16. We moved uh, our FXS single staking to a CLP position because the single staking rewards were, they had become non-existent. I don't know if, I think the boosted rewards had expired or there just wasn't enough volume on, on the Frax network for, for single staking to be profitable. Moved to a CLP position, uh, made significantly better yields. Uh, we did open up a, a CLP position in Carrot, which I will explain Carrot uh, a little bit there. It, it yielded 35% in April. So mm-hmm. we put about 9,000... No, ten thousand dollars into carrot two weeks into April, and it yielded thirty five percent in that two two and a half weeks. Significant amount of yield, very specific circumstances that resulted in that amount of yield, and uh, everything is okay. Michael is working; he's filming a music video, so he is. Happy, healthy, and busy on a beach in Malibu. So if you want to go there, you can find him. Uh, So Carrot, for example. Carrot is a token for the NFT collection titled My Pet Hooligan. I I own one of those NFTs. I happen to get an airdrop of this token. Uh, My Pet Hooligan is this like murderous rabbit that they're trying to build out like a Grand Theft Auto open world game for the NFT collection. It's going very well. A lot of hype, a lot of money. Um, it actually looks really cool. Not financial advice, but it's worth checking out um, the the collection in the game. Um, I own one of the NFTs, so I got these tokens. My first thought was, where are these tokens trading? These tokens were released on Coinbase Exchange, Gate.io, uh, KuCoin, and Uniswap. And as soon as I saw it was Uniswap, I was like, is it V3? It's V3. Perfect. What's the liquidity look like? Had a decent amount of liquidity, like $1.5 million. But the price was out of range for most of that liquidity. So inadvertently, it was printing significant yield uh, for those who were LPing the token. And uh, so we jumped into it. And we earned 35% of our principal amount uh, in like two and a half weeks. Unicorn situation, uh, you know, just happenstance that we were involved with that, but it did present itself an opportunity. 
And so we took advantage of that, made like $3,600 off of $10,000 $10, principal. And we're still farming this token today. I think to this day, it's still earning close to 500% APR. So we're just going to keep uh, farming it. Um, and so I'm, and I've gone through and now we're starting to experiment with some other tokens that I've found that have a similar liquidity profile have a similar opportunity when it comes to liquidity and yield and overall safeness. And it's presenting a nice fringe strategy for us that I think will boost our yield percentages uh, a good chunk uh, in the coming months. So we continue, I continue to hunt for opportunities like this. Um, I think they're out there. The number of new tokens launching and the number of new large scale tokens coming into the market, um, and just the overall growth of DeFi into this bull market, there are going to be opportunities like this where we temporarily move into an asset, take advantage of high yield with a relatively stable price, and then we move on. And so this is one of those ones that I'm monitoring now. We're about three weeks into it. Uh, it's continued to treat us well, and we will uh, we will go from there. But there are opportunities out there for us to snipe CLP positions uh, for relatively ro low risk and a, and a high output. And so that is one of those ones that I was, I was quite proud. Had a moment, pat, no pun intended, pat myself on the back. I, I, there was, a, you know, have a moment of opportunity to realize uh, we had a chance to make some money off of it, and we did. Uh, and then obviously we did random rebalancing and holdings uh, of positions. So we talk about uh, the overall yield generation for the protocol. Since October, October is when we really adopted this new strategy and we've continued to build it consistently month after month. So October was 5.6%. November was off the charts for volume. That was kind of an outlier, but we took full advantage of it. And then since then, we've kind of just built towards uh, growing this percentage month over month, 6.6, 6 6.6, 6 6.1, and then 7.8, 8.1. So we've had an opportunity to continue to grow our yield generation uh, per month uh, on the DeFi fund. Now, remember, the yield we generate for the DeFi fund month over month, that is gross yield. So it is the beginning month's balance of the DeFi fund's fiat value. And this is our gross yield over the month. Now, naturally, there's some impermanent loss in uh, running CLPs, but we manage it relatively closely. Uh, we have monthly expenses that we have to account for, a uh, small amount of salaries, small amount of uh, tech expenses, and then uh, you know lawyers' fees and, and little stuff like that back in Panama. And we can kind of go over details of that when it comes to the client side later. And then we do token buybacks, right? So we, in general, we buy back anywhere from twenty to thirty-five thousand dollars in tokens per month, burn them or reward them, bring them out of circulation, reduce the supply, and so all of these things kind of go into an aggregate amount that allows us to um, kind of display the health of the fund. But this is our yield generation, our gross yield generation, month to month, and how we're going from there. So we talk about the DeFi fund and how resilient it is against market movements. So like I said, April was the first significant month for the, was, was significant for the crypto industry because it was the first major pullback on Bitcoin and everything else um, since we really kind of kicked off. And we wanted to see how the DeFi fund would respond to that circumstance. And so despite individual altcoins within the portfolio performing quite poorly from a price standpoint with our active management we remained basically identical to eth's price variance so on the left side here these are all the individual assets within the DeFi fund rollbit bitcoin eth pendle op link lido arb snx fxs radiant now, each individual asset is always going to have a different price variance. And in the month of April, some of them got hit 
hard, like real hard, like radiant negative 47%, FXS 45%, SNX 43%. These are significant value decreases in the individual assets. However, as you can see, the DeFi fund only lost about 17.5% of its value right in line with Ethereum at 17.4%. That's not counting the money that we used to buy back assets, buy back tokens, or pay some operating expenses. So if you were to account for that capital, we'd actually would have been around like negative 14%. So we would have beat everything except for Rollbit. Rollbit, unicorn of this pullback this last month, only lost 8% of its value. But the market in general had a huge flush. All of these assets saw massive reductions in value, yet because of our active management of the DeFi fund, we were able to preserve all the value that we gained from uh, the yield, and we were able to stay right in line with Ethereum's price variance. Naturally, Bitcoin and Ethereum go down 15 and 17%. It's only fair that, you know, you expect a contraction. And this is part of what it is to run a hedge fund, right? So Block Central is essentially a crypto hedge fund. There are months of contractions. There's months of expansion. When the months of contraction happen, you want to make sure that the contraction is the least amount of possible. However, there are months like April, where even your flagship assets like Bitcoin and ETH lose 15 to 17% of its value, you're going to go with it. But what we can do is we can set ourselves up for success uh, going into May, and that's what we've done. But I do want to point out on the seller side, we talk about like the health of the asset, health of block, right? And people have expressed to me like, hey, you know, like the value of blocks kind of been up and down and, you know, is everything okay? And I explained to them, I was like, yeah, check the Ethereum chart. So the top chart is our is the block chart fiat value. Looks like a roller coaster. That's Ethereum making it look like a roller coaster because if you look at our ETH price for the token, it is moving in essentially one direction, you know, it, up and to the right. And that's what we like to see. So this is a good reminder for us, and it's what I usually use to take a snapshot of like the health of the token is, is on deck screener. You can come over on deck screener there right here, USD slash wrapped ETH. This button, this button will switch between the ETH price and the USD price. So if you want an idea of how the asset is performing against the backing asset, instead of just fiat value, you can come here and you will see that we are, since migrating, we have shown significant growth in the last 29 days. 21%. So Block's ETH value has grown 21% in the last 29 days, where if you look at Block's fiat value, it's 13%. So there's an 8% price variance or like percentage gain variance between these two values. So that's just something that we like to point out to let people know like there are there's context to um a lot of this what you're seeing on the charts and it's our job as a team to communicate that context to you. So this is something to keep in mind. Um we are paired against ETH. It is a volatile asset. It's not as volatile as Polygon, which is which we, we got away from that on purpose. Because if you go look at the Matic chart, you'll see why we got away from Matic when it comes to our backing asset. Because our fiat chart wouldn't even look like that if we were still paired against Matic. So, uh, But this is always something, if you want to check the overall perceived value of the asset, uh, you can always switch between the fiat price and the ETH price, and you can kind of get an idea of, of what's happening here. But this is a really interesting month for us, and I didn't want to shy away from it. That's why I had Ian. I was like, Ian, make me a slide that shows what the DeFi fund did against all the assets within the fund, and let's talk about how Block has remained in this constant growth against ETH. Um, because I wanted to really highlight the fact that when the months are good, 
and we're printing yield and the price is going up and the macro market's going up, we have these awesome moments of expansion. But when the price is going down and the macro market is contracting, we can maneuver through it to avoid the altcoins that we're farming. We can avoid them dragging us even deeper uh, into like a, a momentary contraction. So all these assets, me personally, and if you talk to Michael, all these assets are things that we believe will um, rebound and probably rebound into all-time highs uh, as we move through the rest of the bull market. We don't think the bull market's over. We think we probably have another year, 18 months uh, of what we would consider a bull market. In that time, you will probably see two more alt seasons where you'll see these assets cycle up and down, and we will continue to evaluate and ride uh, through that volatility and print yield uh, through that process. But it is something that I wanted to highlight that once you put it into context and once you understand what could have been versus how we managed the situation, I think April uh, gave us a real opportunity to display the resiliency of the fund and, and the strategy in general. So, Bitcoin is shaking his head like up and down. <laughs> yeah. It's been pretty interesting to watch the market over the last couple of weeks. Moving on, total revenue. We talked about this on the first page, $296,830. We are so close to $300,000. Obviously, we're going to clear it uh, for the month of uh, May. We should hit $400,000, I'm hoping, uh, by the end of July. But by then, we should have client revenues coming in um, and... That number starts to change drastically, which is which is the plan, right? Fund diversification, obviously, in the center here is client miscellaneous. We talked about that last couple uh, monthly reports. As we build out this infrastructure, uh, we have uh, more and more capital being committed to it without sacrificing too much of the yield that we're generating. So, the the process for building out client services is. Uh, complex. It's labor intensive. It's capital intensive. Not all that capital is being spent. A lot of capital is being put into different, I want to say escrows, but different accounts. So for example, we have two banks in Panama. We have in within one of those banks, we have two accounts. One's a standard bank account for our business. Another one is a SWIFT uh, GPI account. So if anyone knows Swift Global Banking Network, um, we have an opportunity to expand our uh, network internationally. So we needed an account that had access to uh, Swift's network, GPI network, including the FIN network within the GPI. Uh, on top of that, we have the OTC service, which um, we needed capital in to test and retest and scale those transactions uh, to make sure that those are all um, working properly and in compliance and everything is being um, uh, set up according to you know regulation in Panama. And so you do have... Um, what is... Hold on. <laughs> Pip is sharing gifts now. Oh my god. All right. If you guys are reading Phipps meme, you have to go read the general chat. We can address that later. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so client services is an intensive part part of it's a it's an intensive process, right? So like um it just it moves slow. Not only does TradFi in general move slow, Central American TradFi moves slower because they have a different pace of life. So in Costa Rica, you hear people say Pura Vida a lot. Uh, I think they say it in Puerto Rico too. Uh, but a lot of Central and South American countries, there's a different pace to life and there's a different pace to business. And so we find ourselves waiting, things getting done a little slower than we had hoped. Oh, it's a four-day holiday weekend oh it's another four-day holiday weekend so there's stuff like that where like there's a cultural um discrepancy where DeFi and crypto is like 24 7 and never shuts off and we tend to work fast because things change fast 
where TradFi, and especially TradFi in Central and South America, it's a different pace. And so we're also battling a bit of the cultural, uh, you know, divergence uh, when it comes to when it comes to that. But we're making progress. Uh, we are well into building the client portal. So Ian and Michael, ha- or Ian and Barry have been working on the client portal. It is almost done, including KYC and AML documentation that gets sent straight to the, our lawyers. Um, so it's it's actually really cool to see it all start to come together from like a tangible. You can see it. You can you can play with it. That's what she said, and uh, you can like kind of see it actually like being built, which is it was pretty cool. Now I have to look for. Oh man, squirrels here! There goes there goes the house squirrel shirt squirrel arrived. He's going to start hiding nuts everywhere. All right, block token dynamics. Let's move on. Um, circulating supply, 59,286,000. NFT contract has 13.9 million, and we've burned 1.8 million. I feel so much better seeing this number be like a true number because uh, it is. it was kind of crazy to see like the 180 million when we never really burned that many tokens actively from the market now we're to the point where everything that's circulating is everything that exists and everything that's being in use so part of that circulating supply though is roughly 2.7 million tokens that's being held in the DeFi fund and some people have figured it out others are just enjoying it there's more rewards going out per day than people originally anticipated that is by design because of the new mechanics Everything that goes to the roar contract and triggers to be paid out, 45% of that is burned instantly. So the team decided, what's the best way to uh, reward everybody for sticking through this migration with us and sticking through the last nine months with us? And while we're incredibly close to launching client services, it is taking longer than we anticipated. Well, we can take this 2.7 million and we can push a little extra to the reward contract every day uh, to make sure that you guys who are staking and farming are being rewarded for being here. And so at the same time, roughly half of that token uh, supply will be burnt because of the new mechanics. So it's a win-win for the protocol and for you guys who are here and have been patient and uh, supportive. And so we wanted to make sure that we rewarded everyone. So if it seems like the farm APY and the staking APY are higher for longer than you anticipated. It's because they are. We're intentionally rewarding you guys because a lot of these tokens that we're holding were buybacks and OTCs from pre-migration, and we're just sitting on them. There's no point in keeping them, so we're going to burn half and reward half. And at the end of the day, uh, we will be able to keep rewards where they are for you know, maybe another month or so. And while we continue to build out client services, you guys will be rewarded for your time. So I felt like that was a win-win for everybody. Um, I don't consider it inflation because these tokens were bought back from holders uh, and they just were accounted for. And now we can go through and we can redistribute them and burn most of them. Because as people cycle in and out of staking and farming, maybe sell a little, some people buy some more, whatever it might be. Um, We just continue that game of attrition where we're constantly burning supply. The overall token supply is going down. The DeFi fund in general continues to earn revenue. We use a little bit of that revenue every day, every week, every month, buy back tokens and get rid of them forever. My hope is someday we're all just fighting over fractions of one token. Honestly, that's just that's the that's the utopian outcome. I don't know how long that would take, but it'd be kind of funny. Theoretically. Anyway, moving on. Uh, so we have the same philosophy as we did pre-migration. As much as the capital as possible is in the DeFi fund, right? So in this regard, 86.5% of the capital that we have within the treasury is in the DeFi fund. A tiny bit in operational balance. 
a lot of it is in the LP, but not in the farms. So I've explained this to a couple people because people, a couple people have asked. We provided about seventy-five thousand dollars in liquidity, but only about ten thousand dollars is in the farm. Everything else that's in the farm is you guys, you farmers, uh, like community members. So you can create LP put tokens, but not deposit them in the farm, and you're still providing liquidity to the protocol. You just your liquidity is on QuickSwap. It'll earn a little bit of um, uh, reward from QuickSwap itself for providing that liquidity, but most of your rewards come from farming. We are out of the farm. You guys are in the farm. You get a vast majority of those rewards. Uh, so that's our our general breakdown. Again, we try to keep 80, 85, 86.5 percent of the uh, capital from the treasury in the DeFi fund. The numbers. This is the most boring part. I wish I wish Michael was here. All of our positions, just overall performance. Again, it was a it was a tough month. I can try to spin it, but you guys are smart, and there's no reason for me to. And you get it. You understand that there's going to be months where it's just blood in the streets, and you do your best to survive. You you protect as much capital as you can. And you just position yourself to um, make the most of the uh, situation you find yourself in. Uh, so, you know, we, for example, number 12 here, this is the carrot position I was talking about. Wrapped ETH carrot, uh, $10,000, $3,600 in yield. So that was a pretty, it's a very lucrative um, position. And uh, we continue to play in that and look in a couple others because we think um, there's opportunities there to snipe some liquidity and some fees. Goral was promised a few million. Where did it go? Uh, I would check Barry's mattress in Ireland. You should go there and see if it's there. That's what I was told. Anyways, that's the rumor. Not financial advice. Don't hold me to it. The rumor is all your money's in Barry's mattress. Moving on. Uh, DeFi fund allocation. Again, uh, client side has uh, 32% of the capital right now. Um, here's the actually, like, this is the thing that I, somebody else asked me about this the other day, and this is my counter argument. 32% of the capital is not earning yield, and yet we still earned 8% on the strategy. Take that in consideration. If that 32% was back in the fund, our yield probably would have been around 12%. That's how much we've refined the strategy over the last um, six months. So like these November, December, January, and most of February, the all of the capital, specifically January and or December and January, all the capital was in the fund and we earned 6.6%. Now we've continued to refine the strategy. We've continued to grow the way we manage the opportunities. And even though 32% isn't earning yield because it's committed to building out client services, which we're immediately committed to bringing that money back as soon as possible once we get everything set up. Um, despite 32% not earning yield, we still earned 8%. So that is a testament to how we continue to grow and expand the strategy is as we continue to find ways to enhance earnings with the capital we have. And so what I'm excited about is when we get to the point where we can replenish that capital back into the DeFi fund and then start bringing client revenue into the fund, that's just going to supercharge this already refined strategy that we continue to work on and we continue to find opportunities with. And so despite months of contraction like April, long range... I think we can earn a significant amount of yield and that's only going to equal more value for everybody who's a token holder within the protocol. No, oh, no, not my closet. Michael's going to listen back to this and be like, what is these random, what are these random comments I'm hearing? <laughs> uh, just more numbers, uh, DeFi fund operational assets. Those always, uh, fluctuate depending on how many tokens we're holding random assets that are in the wallet that aren't in clp positions 
uh, end of the month here was 31,000. It was up 14,000. That's mostly just tokens that we um, reacquired uh, that are sitting in the wallet. Uh, this is the negative 17.5% right here. This 106 from 606. Um, the good news is because we use the beginning of the month's balance for the next month's yield, I have a feeling May's yield is going to be a big number. That's just my intuition. My intuition is May's yield is going to be a big number. And so uh, this is the 17.5%. This is what I was talking about in the slide above. Um, Bitcoin went down 15%. ETH went down 17.4%. DeFi fund, despite the underlying assets getting absolutely hammered, we stuck right by ETH with a 17.5%. But in this market, we know how quickly things can change. May or June, we could easily see a 20% month in the other direction. All we can do is continue to position ourselves to earn revenue along the way, continue to reduce the supply of the token, build out client services, and... Um, Get ready for that next phase of the protocol. Treasury allocations. Again, this is part of the same number. Um, DeFi fund all the way down to seeds and farms. Still showing that same uh, contraction. Operational LP accounts. Again, more boring numbers. You can look at it when we post the playback, um, but it's not worth going over right now. Protocol metrics. Before we jump in that, no questions. Perfect. All right. Uh, protocol metrics. Uh, we usually run through this real quick just to go through numbers. Uh, fully diluted value market capitalization went from 836 to 787. Uh, this is mostly to do with the fact that we burned almost 2 million tokens. Plus, I think the price dropped a little bit from the beginning of the month. I'd have to look at it, but I believe that's the case. Circulating market cap 637. Treasury totals 578. Yep, like we talked about. Uh, liquidity pool. So this is from when we launched the migration to end of the month. So 107 to 223, back in liquidity 53. The numbers are always what I care about, these ratios. So six and seven, LP to treasury ratio is 38. LP to market cap ratio is 28%. And then backing LP to market cap ratio is 14%. Um, these numbers here, more specifically, LP to circulating market cap ratio, 35%. That's super healthy because that means the backing is 17.5%. So with the last, um, with the previous protocol, these numbers were closer to 20 and 40%. And the reason they're a little bit lower is because a lot of people opted into staking instead of the farm. So, um, so naturally, what's going to happen is they're going to be slightly less liquidity, but it's not unhealthy. So anything above 10 and 20%, if you have a backing LP ratio of 10% and a total LP ratio of 20%, that's healthy. That's a healthy LP ratio. We've always been way above that. So to have roughly 15 or 14 and 28 or uh, 17 and 35, um, that's actually extremely healthy. <laughs> Number 11, block, block token value at the beginning of the month, 0 0.0000, yeah. It didn't exist. That's why. Super helpful. I'm going to yell at Michael for this. These are super helpful uh, comparisons from month beginning to month end. <laughs> uh, projected single staking APY, 19.38%. Projected farm APY, 65.1%. We're still right in those numbers. you know. And then the total treasury value loss is, that's the 17% once you account for DeFi fund and operational. Again, 17% when Bitcoin and ETH both drop roughly the same amount. We make make do with what we have, but as long as we have money in the fund, we continue to earn revenue, and I fully expect a lot of those assets to bounce back. Token supply and burn. We started with 75 million. We're down to almost 73. Uh, circulating supplies under 60 million. Uh, block remaining NFT contract, 13.9 million. Uh, but again... That number is always being replenished from reward activity. And on top of that, you never know when we might drop some tokens in the contract manually. Uh, but ultimately, the NFTs have been one of the best value gains for holders in, in the project. So um, 
they are, I think they're, according to mint price, they're already fully collateralized with block. They've paid out almost 55% APR since launching. And uh, they will continue to get block fed into the contract as it decays. So as you know, the Block Central Viking Collection is a liquid decaying um, NFT contract. If you don't know what that means, please check out the documentation. It explains what that means and, and how cool it is. I think it's cool. Uh, and so it's, it's worth checking out. So if you ever see an NFT come up for sale on Alpha Shares and or OpenSea for the Block Central Viking Collection, I would seriously consider uh, picking one up. And plus, the art cool is freaking awesome. If it's a Vikings, if it's a Valkyrie's Vanguard, uh, talk to Fip about that. He's he's all about the Vanguard. Uh, we burned 1.8 million tokens, which is 2.3 percent of the supply. I would like to stick to that number. Two and a half percent is a solid burn rate for. Um, the month we didn't overextend ourselves by acquiring tokens uh, but we still burn a significant amount of of them to impact the supply right so like 2.3 percent month after month you start to have some significant supply uh reductions uh once you start to add up the months and then last thing is market otc token buy and burns uh we spent just over $20,000 in token purchases during the month of April. Uh, and that totaled uh, $1.879 million. And I believe that's it. That is the whole of the uh, DeFi fund report. As always, our landing page on the back with the protocol wallets. Um, but that is all she wrote. That is April's end of month report. Jughead wants to know, does burning tokens increase the value uh, indirectly? So value is derived by how much people are willing to buy and how much, how much, which price point people are willing to buy at and which price people are willing to sell at, right? And so the idea for us specifically is we have a DeFi fund that is earning revenue. And over the long term, theoretically, should be increasing in value, right? And even if it's stagnant in value, it's still earning revenue, which revenue is new capital, fresh capital that you can then use to reacquire tokens. Reacquiring tokens generally results in buy pressure. But more importantly, by reducing supply and either keeping the DeFi funds value stable or increasing the per token value over time will go up does that mean the value on the market will reflect that like accurately at all times no people tend will choose to move on or buy in the price will be above what the inherent value of the token is against the fund the price will be low that number that's the general volatility we'll see as people come and go from the protocol however it is a game of attrition, and the house holds the DeFi fund. And the DeFi fund, as long as it's in existence, will earn revenue. That revenue is new. That revenue theoretically is unlimited, provided that we have capital in the DeFi fund. But the tokens are not unlimited. The tokens can never be in, um, minted again. And due to the mechanics, we will always be reducing supply. So given the game of attrition there, the price has no choice at some point to go in one direction. And uh, that's the general sense of burning supply. It's not something that happens overnight. It's not something that happens suddenly. It is uh, a slow like build towards um, value growth. And... I'll be honest with you. The team is way more patient than most people. <laughs> and so if we have a DeFi fund that's earning revenue, uh, that price will, over time, increase 
uh, as people um, choose to take profits, which I always recommend. I know FIP will uh, fight me on this, but I tell people, set your dynamic strategies to take profit, whether it's 20% or 80% or 100%. Take profit, because what's going to happen is your principal capital will will remain roughly the same. And while your principal capital remains roughly the same, we're reducing token supply. So in relation to your holdings, your ownership percentage is increasing. And as your ownership percentage is increasing and the DeFi fund's value is increasing, you own a larger share of that value, right? And so you can still take profits the whole time which means you'll have fresh ETH that you can take, reinvest, or take and um, you know, buy your partner a nice present for their birthday or go reinvest in meme coins, 10x or 100x your money and bring that money back to Block Central. But the idea is, is that as long as you're not selling your principal, your ownership percentage of token supply is increasing over time because we are decreasing the supply on our side. So... Um, Through all of those uh, general um, mathematics, the idea is that the supply will go down, the value will stay the same or increase, and the value will be set accordingly. You can only do that for so long before the value of the token only moves in one direction. So, if for those, it is a game of patience, it is a game of um it's a long-term investment that's why we always preach tradfi marrying tradfi with DeFi earnings because we always had that long-range view it's not particularly popular in DeFi, especially in discord DeFi, where people want results in days or weeks however we do feel um what we've built our particular niche uh we've done a good job of um displaying value now here's the other thing we're nine months into the protocol we've done in the nine months of this protocol we've probably missed maybe six weekly updates and we've never missed a monthly update out of the nine months that we've done them so i come back to like the team's commitment to making sure that you guys are always informed and that we're doing our best to let you know what's happening and we'll continue to do that so um it's just just something to keep in mind as we move through this process and again once client services is fully up and running and we finally get revenue in the door 75 80 percent of that revenue is coming back to the DeFi fund and back to the token and so we will boost the DeFi fund's principal value which will boost the DeFi fund's revenue plus the parts of the um client revenue that's going to come back to buying back and essentially destroying supply. I think there's good things ahead for us. It's just a matter of um, getting there. And Garo, I've been 100% compounding since day one. (laughs) That's your guys' prerogative. As somebody who preaches portfolio management, it's, it's the same thing I said when we launched. I said, do not overcommit to us 10 20 percent of your portfolio uh, treat it as like a keystone a slow moving okay earning investment that it will pay off in the long term then take the other 80 90 percent of your portfolio and go play in crypto that's what we said and we say that to this day and within that we designed dynamic strategies to let you take profit and not only that we encourage you to take profit so like we're trying to be like anti defi degen where like we tell people don't over invest don't fully compound but i don't control what you guys are doing so yes i did say strategy squirrel i know squirrels don't have strategies besides burying nuts and hoping they find them in the spring uh yes we did hit an hour with that, I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you guys so much for being here. And thank you for... Um, can I buy a villain Panama with block token? And Garo, let's talk in a year. Maybe less. Maybe. I don't know. I'm just entertaining now. 
All right, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Let me give away some block to a couple few lucky people. Um, hmm. Let's do $20 in block to three people. We're going to do God Mode, Crypto Boss. We are going to do Squirrel. Thanks for stopping by. And last but not least, let's do Lazy Z Lady. Those are the three winners for today. Thank you so much for coming to the monthly report. Uh, keep an eye on the um, announcements in the community. It is kind of boring running a crypto hedge fund, but we try to make it as entertaining as possible. So appreciate you guys being here. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you again. And have a great weekend. Try to do something fun this weekend. Summer's coming. It's going to get hot. Go to the beach. Have a picnic. If you're a squirrel, go to the Coliseum and take some pictures. Pictures or it didn't happen. Have a great weekend, everybody.